So big welcome to this class tonight. And we may or may not use this recording. A reminder that we have a class next Monday and then next Friday your first assignment is due where you need to choose one theorist and then write about that theorist and theory and also your own personal reflections. I suggest that you begin firstly with the theory and the theorists before you do your own reflections because your whole assignment needs to have one major idea through the whole assignment and that'll probably build around the theory and the theorist. I suggest that you collect eight to 12 scholarly resources that you're going to work with and that you could go to Google Scholar, put in, say, injustice and conflict theory, education and sociology and classroom teaching. It could then bring up some resources. You could then look at these resources, read them. And also the beauty of Google Scholar is you got your citation there already. You can write this all in your own words and you'll have quite a nice assignment unfolding there on the theory and theorists. And then if you go back to your personal reflections, you can tie your personal reflections into the theory and theorists. Now, you could keep a, a bit of a journal where you write about your reflections on your years of schooling, the highlights and the low points, again, trying to relate them to the theory and theorists. You could begin at the beginning of your assignment with an introduction, which could be the last thing you write because you want it to relate to everything in your assignment. And then you could move on to writing a bit about practical application in the classroom. Again, you could interact with scholars there that you have gathered from Google Scholar and the College Online Library resources. Then you could include something on Christian perspectives, but again, interacting with scholars in every paragraph when you write on that. And then your conclusion should draw something together from the whole assignment for assignment two. We've put a bit of resource online to help you with that. And then you can ask further questions on that next week. Excuse That'll me, Sam, you. sorry. Yeah. I'm um, sorry, last question. Um, you just mentioned with practical application about mm. its application in the classroom. Is that what mm. we're focusing on? Practical application within the classroom? I think that's most valuable to you. Um, I think that the one thing that every teacher wants to do is to succeed in the classroom. And that's why each week, I, I think that certainly what occurs to me is that we can have theories of education, but it's really what happens in the classroom. And we'd love to have a class with 100% of students interested and on site. But in my experience in teaching some high school classes, um, by definition, only 50% of your class are going to be above 50% in their performance. And those who aren't going to perform above 50% often wake up to that fact and they realise they're not going to succeed in being a great science student or great math student. And they think about what else could I do to succeed in this class? And some students will decide they're going to become the class clown so that'll be a great success for them in their student journey do you any of you have class clowns in your classes or seen any others will decide they'll become disruptive and this will make them a hero with their peers and so there's all sorts of things that students in the bottom half of the class could pursue sometimes the students in the top half of the class pursue that so i think this practical application in the classroom i think is such an important question for us to think about, isn't it? As uh, for me, it, it is. Um, how do you do well in that? Do you have any thoughts on that, Isaac? In terms of symbolic interactionism within the classroom? Yeah, I would think if you went to Google Scholar and if you were to pick up something on um, you know, symbolic interactionism and in the classroom and you could find something on that, um yeah I, I think you could um you know find a bit that you could bring into it there and you may have ideas back in your own personal reflections that relate through but i think for it to succeed as an assignment you really want some good theoretical ideas as well don't you that tie it all together 
Yeah. Any further questions um, along these lines? So if you do have further questions, certainly send them through to me. As an exercise, I'm suggesting that if you can find the time, and certainly if you're short of time, then you wouldn't have to. But, um, a weekly exercise for this next week, just taking a few moments each day and now and again, is to think about keeping a journal where you document your interactions with three or more people, such as students or others in the class. Those students who are doing well and friendly, those who are unfriendly or disinterested, those teachers um, who are friendly to you, those who may have uh, other agendas. And how do you interact? And uh, Goffman is a central theory here in that he says we automatically interact in certain ways with our language and facial expression and body language. And we can manage these impressions. So if you're having a bad day, you can be cheerful, think cheerful thoughts. It's this managing of impression can create a positive classroom environment or a negative classroom environment. Um, I remember meeting with one person and he said to me, oh, I'm in a terrible place and these are terrible gatherings. And when I went to the place where he was, it was wonderful and everyone was friendly. And he just saw the world in a negative way. And I think um, how you manage impression makes such a difference. And so uh, I think it's worth reflecting on this. And in this little exercise, you could write down these journal entries. And also we often forget, Goffman talks about how students influence teachers, the teachers influence students. But we also forget that there's another dialogue partner, yourself. That is, self-talk can make the world of a difference. You know, uh, I, I asked a teach, I asked a student one uh, year. You know, are you interested in this science subject? And he said, "No, I'm going to get a job anyway, whatever happens. So I'm not at all interested." Anyway, I had the same student next year, and the economy had crashed, and there were no jobs. And I said to the student, "Are you interested in the subject this year?" And he said. I'm not going to get a job anyway, so I'm not interested because I won't get a job. <laughs> There's no way of uh, you know meeting uh, the uh, aims of this student. Anyway, I, I sought to inspire him and encourage him and listen to him and tell him about how exciting and valuable science was. And I got there a little bit, but uh, self-talk, I, I just kept telling myself, you know, even though the students don't tell me they're interested, there's good reasons to be interested. This is exciting. This is science. How can anyone not be interested in science? I kept telling myself. And uh, most of the time it worked. There is a psychological theory called cognitive behavior theory that tells us that as people want to choose to think, that shapes the way the world is. So if there's troubles and you think happy and positive, that's how you'll see the world. Cognitive behavior therapy. So uh, self-talk, I think, can be interesting. Now, as Christians, you could also talk with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So if things aren't going so well, you can pray to God. How do you see it? And God could say to you, or I see things can go okay, even though yeah, things aren't going so well. So Christians can have this positive perspective that can come out of prayer, come out of reading scripture, come out of reading the Psalms where David was going through tough times. The Apostle Paul going through tough times spoke about having love, faith, hope, joy. So all of these Christian perspectives can be helpful as uh, well. So I've just added those uh, there. And then in terms of some theory, we have uh, Eglatus talks about performing dramatic learning in the classroom. That is, you can put on hats and performance in the classroom and you can put on a cheery hat and then you can encourage the students to try different hats and learn some emotional um, intelligence as they try different ways of uh, viewing the world. So these theories from Goffman on the presentation of self in everyday life and also the managed heart um, and human feeling um, can be resources that you could uh, think about applying there. And I've put some other resources from Google Scholar here on um, uh, this reading that's on Moodle 
that you'll find uh, there on the uh, Moodle site. So uh, just uh, encourage you to apply some of those. And this tutorial exercise uh, there that I've put up, if you take time to do that, you could find that very useful. And you might want to continue practice journal keeping through your uh, uh, school teaching training journey and as you become a school teacher you might keep a journal actually it's interesting what do you do when something goes badly and most of us would say i want to forget that but i was reading the other day how can i grow through this so when things go badly think how can i grow um uh, through this um experience and so even bad experiences are growth opportunities and you can if you find some um, fellow teachers or students to talk with you can say well I had a tough day today um, I know others uh, even um, uh, my daughter she's a school teacher in um, year eight in a Christian school and, and she'll tell me about the tough time she had and I find that quite uh, useful um, to just dialogue through. How did you feel? How did things uh, go? So I encourage um, you to have these opportunities for dialogue uh, there as well. Yeah. So further uh, questions that you might have on the assignment or questions that you might have on this tutorial exercise that I'm suggesting you consider this week. If there's no more questions, and I'm still open to questions, if there are some questions, then on the uh, Moodle website, I've put up some videos for this week. So if you wanted to go to those uh, videos, then uh, you could um, see uh, the resources that there under week uh, two, so module two. And then uh, week three, uh, we've got some uh, readings from chapter five of uh, Gurmov and Paul. That's uh, quite sociologically deep, doesn't automatically connect with what we're saying in a sociology of education, but it's seen as being uh, valuable. And then I've put up the week three tutorial exercise. I've also put up student entries. If you want to put some uh, journal entries here on how you've gone, that would be useful. And then I've put up these uh, videos. And uh, the first one I put up is the general video for today's class tonight on social identity of the teacher and the student. I've then put up two application videos, one on mathematics how do people, students and teachers feel in a maths classroom? And then I put up one on um, arts and music and you could go to that. And then next week we go on to families. So there's some valuable resources that you could use for today's class. And so for today's class, I want to think about social identity of the teacher and the student and how the teacher works with their different social identities and how you might understand and apply those different social identities in your class. So let me take a few moments now to talk about the social identity of the teacher and the student and how your family, how your experiences shape your identity, and this relates to the assignment that you're writing, how do your experiences as you went through schooling and as you are experiencing things now and when you go into the classroom in a year or two or three to come, how will that shape your identity? Interesting, Goethe from Germany said that if you just treat people as they are or as they think they are, they'll stay the same. But if you treat them in a positive manner, and this fits with the biblical passages that talk about thinking positively, speaking positively, seeing people as they might be in the best sense of the word, it fits with the prodigal son, doesn't it? 
That is thinking the best, not just uh, heading off to live um, in a difficult situation. So we've got some notes here on how thinking positively can help us to have a positive experience and help our students to have a positive experience and create a positive classroom culture. Think of things as they might be rather than focus on the negative. So in chapter five of the textbook, Marilyn Paul discover, discusses the way in which um, who we become and who we are is shaped by social experiences around us. And we as teachers, if we say positive expectant things to our students, they could live up to those positive expectations. And I've always tried to do that. I'm known for my enthusiasm and excitement in classrooms because I think positive things and I hope students will catch that. And, uh, and when they do, they do well. I've had um, students come back to me over this last few weeks, 15 years later, and say, we got excited by what you said and responded to it. And I thought, they're still excited 15 years later. So something's caught on. But uh, not everyone gets excited, do they? So there's the other side of things. We often internalise values of the groups around us, and then we carry them forward in time. Just a little exercise I mentioned in the video, Edward de Bono's thinking hats. Hands up some of those who've uh, seen Edward de Bono thinking hats. We usually talk about that applying to thinking, but that can apply too to the sense of identity. That is, if you try these different hats, a serious hat or a optimistic hat, then um, that could shape a different sense of of identity there. Catherine, uh, question or thought? Sorry, no, I was just raising raising my hand to say that I'd heard of the thinking hats and then I Yeah, that's yeah. good. And what are your thoughts on the thinking hats, Catherine? Um I use them like I was taught them taught about them in primary school. Yes. Um, and I, yeah, I remember using it for like analysis and things, but yeah, I like the idea of using them for, um, yeah, understanding um, yourself from different, um, yeah, different lenses. And we could use that as part of the emotional intelligence development. Last week, we we're talking about you could use cards and hand out cards and say, how do you feel when you're angry? And, uh, you know, tell us about that. Trying to develop emotional intelligence in the classroom at appropriate times and uh, to know that to say, um, I am angry, you are angry, is not to say who you are, but to say there's um, something going off um, as a bit of a dial in our life saying there could be some reasons to feel angry, but it's a choice whether you act on what those dials say or whether you choose something different. If your petrol gauge on your car says, I am empty, you don't have to just accept it. You could actually put some petrol in and change the situation. And so uh, you could, um, you know, one student could keep poking you and you could say, oh, I'm annoyed um, or you could say, well, I'm going to you know, take certain actions, respond that can show maturity. And so uh, cognitive behavior therapy says you put those on. And the thinking hats says that you could try this. You could actually have some hats and you could make a bit of a game and an activity out of it. So Irving Goffman says we have multiple differentiated identities. That is, everyone has a grumpy self. Everyone has an optimistic self and we make choices each day as to which of these identities we're going to act on. And I know sometimes you can have two or three things that push you towards being grumpy and two or three times you can say, well, I don't have uh, the resources to act with grumpiness. I'm just going to stick with being optimistic today and leave grumpiness till another time. And so you make choices. Now, Christian perspectives can fit in with this in that uh, we're created in God's image good. We can focus on that. There's Christian passages that focus on that. At the same time, there's Christian descriptions of fallenness and also forgiveness and redemption. We can focus on those as well. Certainly there are genetic bodily perspectives, and that's in uh, the reading in the 
um, resource that we uh, have as well for this week, and you could uh, write about those and ADHD and all of those chemical responses and drugs and such forth respond to that. You could uh, write about those as well. But certainly the teacher's self-image uh, and self-understanding are very, very important. So in this assignment that you're doing, you could reflect on how does my family upbringing influence me so some of my family members were teachers and so that influenced me a bit um and uh, some of my family members were a bit interested in science so that's why i chose teaching science um since that time i've drifted a bit into history i went on a holiday overseas in uh, athens in greece and went and uh, uh, found where uh, plato used to give his talks there and where aristotle used to sit and teach and that got me quite excited and then uh, i went to uh, jerusalem in his israel and went to bethlehem one christmas eve and uh, that got me quite excited so history sort of eclipsed my science in recent years but i'm still very interested in the scientific world world and uh, if i walk on the beach i love to collect things and if i uh, um, walk near a gem field i like to look out for sapphires or something so i've still got a, a scientific bent but there's also been a bit of a drift towards uh, history in my life and sociology i had a chance to go to england and give a talk to the british sociological association on churches and schools so uh, that gave me uh so you, you can develop these interests as you go and you can reflect on them and uh, write on them. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I encourage um, uh, you to reflect on how is your culture, your upbringing, all of that effect. Actually, someone asked me the other day, are there any biases in my life? And I started to write a sentence, I'm a white male. And then I thought, oh, I don't need to admit that. So I sort of scrubbed it out. But it's true. Every one of us have uh, biases. Uh, can I get all the white males to put their hand up and admit their uh, biases? And then, um, you know, maybe we don't listen to the uh, females and the other people who have uh, different coloured skins enough to eat. So we all have biases and that comes out through that exercise there a bit. And, and we all fail to listen so you got 25, 30 students. Everyone comes from a different background. And one of the things I want to emphasize in this course is listen to every student, understand their background. And, uh, yeah, we say we're Christians, some of us, and um, but listen to the varieties of Christianity. Uh, I remember once um, I went to get my teeth done and um, the dentist, he filled my mouth up with Tent City and I could hardly speak. And then um, he um, uh, uh, spoke. Uh, he said, uh, what do I do? And I, I said I was involved in a bit of a church and involved in some singing. And, and he said, um, uh, uh, he, and, and he asked me the question, you know, what, what do you do? And, and I said, oh, I'm a teacher, because my mouth was filled up with Tent City. You know? I'm a teacher. And, I, you know? and then um, uh, when I mentioned that I quite like Christian music, he said, oh, he loves Christian music too. And um, and then I responded and I said, I love Hillsong music, I said. And his mouth dropped, the dentist's mouth dropped. And he said, oh, I don't like Hillsong, he said. And I said to him, mouth filled up with tension, what sort of music are you uh, interested in? And he said, at our church, we sing in Latin without musical accompaniment. And I said to him, how many people attend your church? And he said, numbers are not important, he said. And so uh, I thought... You, you got to listen to people and their different backgrounds, don't you? And get a feel for their uh, different backgrounds. I went to one church service and it was a Quaker service. And I discovered they sit still for one hour and no one says anything. So you got to sort of understand where you're going if you go to a Quaker service or, uh, you know, those different services. So there's different experiences. If you have these people in your classroom, then you need to have a sensitivity to these uh, different students that you might have in your classroom there so think about every individual student has different interests and a teacher needs to be aware of these different interests if things are going well charles cooley uses the term looking glass self that is we understand ourselves when we look into the face of others like a mirror and they say something about 
how well we're going. And one of the things I remember was um, I was invited to a guitar playing group once and I played a bit of guitar with some other people who joined us. And I thought this is exciting. I'm really going to enjoy guitar playing. And after three or four weeks, three other people joined the guitar playing group who were brilliant at guitar. And half of us realized we're never going to be much good at guitar. And we gave up guitar playing, never to play guitar um, for the next few years. Since that time, I've taken up playing guitar and piano a bit since. I've recovered from that uh, um, gl uh, looking glass moment when people said, you'll never measure up. So teachers are looking glass people who reflect how students are going, don't we? And we tell them how they're going and how they might do in the life journey. So that's Charles Cooley, the looking glass self and how you as teachers, the expectation that you hold up to students could shape their future and what they do if you say, say they're uh, interested. I don't know what you do if you have a student who wants to be a great athlete and you realise they're too short or they're not going to measure up or so, do you uh, say to them, um, you know, yeah, you could be a great athlete or not. I don't know um, what you say. Um, Catherine, do you have any thoughts on what you say to a student who's going to be an Olympic athlete and they've just got no physical ability and uh, that sort of thing? Any thoughts, uh, Catherine? Uh, I guess you try and find something else they're interested in and encourage them more in that. <laughs> yeah, I remember there was one student in sort of year seven, eight, nine who uh, wanted to be an AFL footballer and we always thought he didn't have what it um, uh, wanted and um, uh, surprise of surprise, year uh, 10, 11, 12, he grew a bit taller and got selected for Carlton Football Club and played for uh, AFL for Carlton. Um, there was a, uh, another student um in uh, Townsville in um, uh, Queensland, whose uh, mum gave him some golf clubs when he was at year nine high school and said uh, he could caddy. And uh, he hit the ball around and decided this was so exciting. Before school, every day for a few years, he would go for a couple of hours before he went to school and hit a golf ball. And, his, uh, and he was told by his father there was no future in it and he should give it up. His name was Greg Norman, and he'd be one of, uh, one of Australia's greatest golfers. So um, yeah, the looking glass self says that there's people out there who'll tell you you're not such a good self, and then there are others out there who will uh, tell you that you could really do so well. So it's worth being aware of the looking glass uh, self um, idea as uh, well. So worth... Um, uh, thinking about that whole uh, looking glass uh, um, uh, self uh, concept uh, there. Yeah. Um, David, what do you think of the looking glass self concept? How can that help a teacher in um, teaching? Um, I just think, um, it, you know, you can just help guide students to where they might want to go because that's sort of what happened to me um in high yeah. school mm. i had no I, I um had no idea where i wanted to go yes and, and, and having a love for for history my um it was actually one of my teachers that set me on a course of being a teacher wow so i just think um with that whole idea you just need to keep looking into your students and it all comes down to knowing them so yes it's usefulness just playing to your students interests and trying to help them find their way in the world. Yes, yes. I, I think that's so valuable, isn't it? As again, uh, listening to uh, students makes such a uh, difference, doesn't it? It's, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, incredibly important. Um, and uh, Matthew, what are your thoughts on the looking glass self? Um, yeah, I think, kind of what you mentioned i think it's good for kind of reflecting the positives um in our students and emphasizing that um rather than the negatives yeah, the, the, yeah. as teachers we've really got that that ability to to yeah lift lift people up rather than you know put them down and that really fits with Goffman's idea of symbolic interactionism. And uh, um, we are like being in a drama on stage where we can put on different 
actors and different acts and different faces and masks and um, clothing and hats. And so we can present ourselves in different ways. And this raises the question in terms of gender. Do people present themselves in different ways as males and females? And does gender segregation help? This raises questions in terms of agency, um, that raises questions in terms of peer group influence. Do peers help us to do well if we're in the top half of the school or uh, we do not so well if we're in the bottom part of the school and we're trying to impress uh, um, peers? So certainly those ideas, I think, are very, very important uh, there. So I've taken two examples then. Um, one is in terms of mathematics and in terms of our expectation in uh, maths. And I gave some reflection, and I've put this up on uh, Moodle, in terms of maths anxiety. So if people tell you that maths is a difficult subject and that you're not going to do so well at maths, or if people make you move through too quickly and speedily, then you won't do so well. Whereas if people give you time and freedom, then you'll do much better there. Isaac, what are your thoughts on the causes of maths anxiety and some of the solutions to the maths anxiety challenge? Um, well, I kind of feel like I could relate back to the other one of just uh, the looking glass self. It'll just be maths anxiety would probably be based on bad experiences and judgment from teachers yeah. uh, or, or family because of failure and because of that they... Um, yeah, just consistently see themselves through that lens of I'm bad at maths, I can't. So I guess, yes. yeah, it'll be the the answer to it would just be teachers encouraging students at, at whatever level they are at. Um, yeah. And yeah, just kind of spurring them on to reach their next level, not the next level yes. of the highest student in yes. the class. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um. Yes, I think that's so important to think positively and to think how can I really communicate that positive sense of hope and identity when it comes to, say, uh, um, maths and uh, the role of uh, maths uh, there. So sociology could shed some light on maths and maths teaching. So I've put those sort of uh, notes up on the um uh on the website and uh, so sociology reminds us that the people around you if they've got positive expectations and encourage you because there's three reasons why people get anxious in maths one is they're pushed too fast the other is that they're um uh, pushed in negative ways and uh, then the uh, other is that if they are um rushed um, uh, without giving the opportunity for agency and choice uh, there. So the video is there if you want to uh, look at that. That's uh, useful. The other one that I've put up is a video on music, and it interested me. Similarly, people can have anxiety with musical instruments, as I mentioned before, or people can develop a love of music depending on uh, whether we tell them that they could do well at music or we give the impression that they're not going to do so well at uh, music. And so I'll put together some uh, notes and a video on that. And uh, so in terms of uh, music, um, there's uh, some notes here on um, sociology and music. And one of the things I noted there was four guys in Liverpool in England were told they'd never amount to much, but they were encouraged to do a bit. And they were the Beatles and Paul McCartney. And it was this opportunity they had. But some people say that genius and music happens just when you get up and go 
but it was the people around them that gave them the opportunity. They discovered someone in London who would uh, do a record, someone in London who would produce their music, someone in, in London who would distribute their music. It's about social networks and the people who give you the opportunity that makes such a world of a difference. So again, social support makes such a difference. And as teachers, you and I are the people who provide that social support. The uh, other thing is uh, I talk a little bit in some of the notes I present is on dramatic theory and the dramatic theory ideas of Eglitus and Goffman is along this idea that we all are constantly aware that there are other people on the stage around us as we grow up as two-year-olds and three-year-olds and primary school children and high school children, and you're always performing to someone. Now, I think the two other people that they miss off here as you're also performing to yourself. And so if you're going to develop deep, strong character as a person, then your values are going to be very, very important. And Russ Harris writes some material on values education. And so Russ Harris on uh, values, and uh, he has online resources. He says that it's performance to self that's so important. And he writes about uh, acceptance commitment therapy to oneself as another performer there. And so I really like the acting mindfully workshops with Russ Harris that talk about um, the way in which you or students, uh, teachers or children perform relates to the way in which they see themselves and respond to themselves. So if you want to look up some of those resources by Russ Harris acting mindfully on um, thinking in mindful ways, then uh, I think there's some really great resources uh, there. And I think he's even got one on uh, the complete uh, worksheets that have got values resources uh, there that you could um, with Russ Harris permission you could um, use uh, there so what's the students values what teacher values you don't have to follow the um, others who speak negatively about you and as Christians we can follow this idea of thinking about what are your true values that you want to be known for uh, and this is what I think Apostle Paul and Jesus really follow is uh, true values. So we perform before different people and they can be your peers. They can be teachers, those whom you admire, your parents. But you are one of the key um, uh, audience members that you're performing to your higher self, your higher values. And then also, if you're a Christian and believe that God is the true eternal um, truth, uh, the Holy One, all goodness resides in him. You're performing towards God and truth and goodness. And even people like Plato and Aristotle, Plato in particular, he was performing towards the good in God or the gods. And so there's something valuable in that that the Greeks also saw. So... Um, uh, we see uh, that there in dramatic performance uh, theory, and we see that in uh, Goffman and others who write about that as well. So let's go back to the assignment then and think a bit more about um, the assignment and uh, how you'll go with that. And can I get everyone to write down what are some things that we've briefly touched on today? What are three things that stood out to you that you've learned from? And uh, we could also think about how that might apply in the assignment today. So 
task one assignment, sociological framing paper. So we're thinking about what stood out today from the uh, self-understanding and self-image of the teacher and student. And we spoke a bit about drama theory or dramatology. That is, everyone performs before an audience. And this could be peers, it could be teachers, it could be the school, it could be parents. But we also perform before an audience of our true self with higher values or of course if you want to perform before your clown self and lower values or uh, the naughty self I suppose you could perform before that and then there is also in terms of the higher values you have God Jesus Holy Spirit church pastors Bible and biblical values as well there and that could relate to aspects of the symbolic interactionism that we're talking about as the third model that we look at. David, out of what we've looked at today, what stood out to you most? I have two takeaways. Um, that was the, um, the, like, through the looking glass person, um, that idea that we talked about. And the second one was the importance of values that individuals hold themselves. Yeah, so good. They're two great points, aren't they? So be aware that people are seeing themselves in others and then uh, values there as well. That's great. If, Catherine, yeah, sorry. If, if, just to quickly elaborate. Um, yeah. The, the reason that those two things just resonated with me was with the the looking glass person like that can for me for the teacher that that can pretty much make or break somebody mm. um, if it like depending on how it's used and the importance of values is um that um you like uh, with students you can only really get yeah, I don't know where I was going with that one, to be honest, but I just know yeah. that. The I like we're saying there with students, if they look to their higher values, what do they want to be known for? And even the student who's down at the bottom, they can look to their higher values. What do you eventually want to know yourself for? And if you keep reiterating that in the classroom, that can really go well and uh, really help. Chris, what stood out to you today? And then um, uh, Matthew, Chris, what stood out to you? What stood out to me? Um, the last thing that we spoke about, uh, performing for others. Interesting, interesting. Um, I think it's an interesting concept, isn't it? This idea of dramatology. We are all on a stage, and uh, this idea that uh, we are all aware that as others see us, it influences our sense of identity. Yeah, I think that's that's probably um where a lot of issues probably for Christians come in, uh, because of our our higher values and our teach end as for all Christians should be the glory of God. We should be expressing this in all that we do, um, and it's probably when we fall into issues, um, when our ultimate values don't coincide with our uh, reflected actions in life so probably important in the classroom to as christian teachers always be coming back to that that there's obviously proximate uh, ends to what we're doing we're like yes we do want to get good grades to impress our parents ultimately the chief end of getting a good grade is to glorify god in that 
So it's probably the importance of making that distinction. That it should never, our, our, our chief end of everything should never be to, you know, whatever it is, just impress people or impress, and get good money, get money or whatever. It's probably the biggest difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. Because we have a distinctive higher value or chief end. The non-Christian does not. And this fits with the idea of admitting weakness. That is, Christians also include an emphasis on transformation, humility, confession, change, admitting weakness and believing that we can change. Whereas some secularists would be proud and say we can't change. Some Christians might be proud and don't want to change. But our Christian message, I think, uh, with an emphasis on, say, repentance, um, the Jesus approach is one of admitting weakness and being willing to change. And so uh, I, I think we can model that in, in the classroom and we can apologize at times in the classroom, not out of weakness, but out of strength and saying, I'm willing to admit I fail at times, and I'm willing to admit God changes me and transforms me, and then move on. You know, don't dwell in the oh, I'm so weak. You know, that sort of says the wrong message as uh, well. Matthew, what stood out to you today? Um, a couple things: the uh, multiple uh, differentiated identities, which was uh, similar to the different thinking hats um, that some of us have covered covered before. Um, I guess considering how our family and cultural up, uh, upbringing influences who we are and our values, um, and then just sort of the stuff we've just been talking about, the uh, looking glass self and the um, who we perform for and things like that. And interesting, the teacher identities, some teachers might uh, put on a coat. In some universities, they put on academic dress. And so when you put on your academic gown, you take on that teacher identity. And if you think about a teacher identity, a teacher identity is firm and friendly. So uh, you might be sort of a joking, each easygoing self. And then at 8.30 a.m., you might put on your teaching jacket and you might think, uh, I've got to put this joking, easygoing self aside, and then I've got to take up, I'm now a firm and friendly teacher. These are the rules, which is number one, we've got functionalism, we've got laws, and then uh, number two, when I face conflict, I'm going to be gentle and kind in conflict. And then uh, number three, I realize there's complexities in language and symbolic interactionism so we could misunderstand one another. So I'm a firm, friendly teacher when I put on my jacket and my teacher identity, just like putting on a hat with de Bono. We have multiple differentiated identities. And as a teacher, my teaching identity begins at 8.30 a.m. And then around 3.30 in the afternoon, I can take it off, hop in my car and become a comedian again or something like that, whatever your other identities are that you want to put on. So uh, I think this idea of identities can be quite valuable. Isaac, um, what stood out to you today? Uh, probably similarly similarly sorry to what david was talking about just with um a teacher making or breaking a student um i think it's it's interesting that the um yeah the way a teacher sees themselves or understands their self um or a lack of their own self understanding um will heavily impact the way that they teach um so you may, may you know bad educational experiences for themselves um, could actually reflect on the way that they educate kids in those areas. Yeah, I really like what you say as the teacher sees themselves and as they see others. So as a Christian teacher sees themselves as complete in God, no matter what the circumstance, and sees others as potentially uh, accomplishing great things because God has given them opportunity, then they can have a really positive view that can be very helpful there. So I really like that. Isaac, that's great. Denisha, what stood out to you today? 
Oh, it's pretty much already been said. I I like the looking glass self thing. Um, I haven't really heard that one before, so I thought that was um pretty cool. Um, and Matt had already said um the multiple differentiated identities. Um, I also thought that was interesting. So good. And then Catherine, what stood out to you today? Um. Yeah, the two things that stood out to me were, again, the looking glass self um, and how um, the way someone else sees you um, and tells you how they see you um, affects how you see yourself. Um, and then also, yeah, just the way that both teachers and students are shaped by our experiences, um, our actions and, uh, sorry, the, the experiences, actions and words um of others so yeah just our different um backgrounds and it's really important just emphasizes again um knowing your students knowing where they come from um knowing um their past knowing your own past and understanding then how that comes into the classroom so good so as we draw it together then i'll just pray in a moment but let me know if you have any questions about the assignment. Um, and uh, next Monday, you'll have another opportunity there. And if you get an opportunity to do some of those uh, journal entries, and if you wanted to put any up on Moodle, then uh, that would be helpful as well. That'll be a chance to reflect on the different hats that people around you are trying on. It'd be worth um, reflecting on how sometimes you feel as though you want to put on grumpy hat, but you decide to put on cheerful hat instead. And uh, that could be a really good exercise. Let's pray then as we draw together today's class. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and reflect on these important insights into the way teachers can change the lives of others through the hats that they wear, through the material that they prepare, through their understanding of social worlds and the ways in which they shape the experiences of everyone around us. We pray as we work on these assignments that are going to give an opportunity to work on a theory and some theorists that will get a better understanding of the social dynamics that take place and a better understanding of the most effective way that we as teachers can respond as we're sitting in different social situations. Be with us, Heavenly Father. We pray that we might become those that you're calling us to be. Be with us, Holy Spirit, that we might be transformed and empowered and be with us, um, Jesus, we pray in all that we do. Amen. So thank you, each one. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Otherwise, I look forward to uh, seeing you again next Monday and to uh, reading the assignments and reflecting on the way in which the insights from these assignments can help you to better understand classrooms and better understand what dynamics are going on in teaching so that you can be better and more effective uh, teachers. So I look forward to seeing things unfold. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks so much, Sam. Thank you.